So, the origins and early composition of the Electoral College of the Empire are extremely obscure. But we do know, however, that elections were always an elite affair, involving only the very highest of nobles and prelates. By the 10th century already, all the major regions of the Kingdom of Germany, which was the core constituent kingdom of the empire, were represented. The stem duchies of, of Lorraine, Saxony, Franconia, Bavaria, and Swabia. Although we do not know the extent to which the dukes and senior lords in these territories would have canvassed their own vassals and dependents for votes and opinions to factor into the, the elections at the time. Though um, the kingdoms of Burgundy and Italy were, were added in the 11th and 10th centuries respectively, uh, none of the Burgundian and Italian lords participated in elections, and it was quickly established that whoever was elected king of Germany by its major lords would accede to those thrones and to the imperial title. The early college was somewhat ill-defined, and there was a sense that there should be unanimity. This was in part because the process of election was bound up with that of homage and fealty. Bavaria, for instance, was absent at Henry de Fowler, Duke of Saxony's election in the early 10th century, due to the Duke's opposition uh, to King Henry's rule, and he had to be compelled by force to acknowledge it. To vote for a leader was to promise him loyalty and homage. Thus, early elections, while not strictly needing to be unanimous for a definitive result, were more a reflection of raw power dynamics than a well-defined legal and constitutional process. One sought as many votes as one could garner, and if that proved the strong enough basis for one's rule, one would impose one's rule on any dissenter willing to resist. Moreover, the appearance of unanimity was considered highly important as it was seen as a sign of divine choice and favor. Usually, the senders in such situations would just absent themselves from the election to preserve the appearance of unanimity, and then they would negotiate with the new emperor behind the scenes so that they could both save face. However, sometimes, as in 1198 or 1314 or 1257, dissenting voices would get together and elect an anti-king, creating a so-called double election. Um, bishops would first be represented in the 11th century due to the growth of their benefices under Henry II, Emperor Henry II, at the end of the 10th century, who established uh, their fiefs as less hereditary counterweights to the duchies, which, while not yet fully hereditary, were already becoming hereditary. In 1237, Mainz, Cologne and Trier, the largest and oldest of the French archbishoprics with the largest archdioceses in Germany, combined to definitively exclude the archbishoprics of Salzburg and Magdeburg. A problem secular electorates possessed, which ecclesiastical electorates did not, is that, there off is that secular electorates were often divided between one's relatives. So a major question in such situations was whether the votes would be divided, alternated, multiplied, or what have you by such divisions, and or maybe whether one branch should just receive the entire electorate, and if so, which. Both the Pope and Emperor wanted an increasingly well-defined group of electors. Counts would be excluded in 1196, definitively. A letter written by Pope Urban IV in 1265 suggests that by immemorial custom, there had been seven princes who had had the right to elect the king and the future emperor. The Palatinate, um, that, that is to say the County Palatine on the Rhine, uh, the Duchy of Saxony, the Margraviate of Brandenburg, um, uh, the Kingdom of Bohemia, the Archbishopric of Cologne, uh, that of Mainz, and that of Trier. Uh, these had uh, just voted in the double election of 1257, and they would be the same to be confirmed by the Golden Bull of 1356 about a century later. A few factors worked to make the process of excluding certain fiefs and princes a lot easier. One is that it was clear that the vote for a certain candidate entailed having to back up his candidacy with force of arms if necessary, and this was very undesirable to many due to the risks and money involved. Another factor was the extinction of many of the old family, families of the empire in the 13th century, as well as their fiefs. For example, the Ludovingers of Thuringia, the, uh, the Stauffers in Franconia and Swabia, and the von Babenbergs of Austria, uh, whose territories and offices had either been partitioned, left unoccupied, or dissolved. Thus, limiting it to that small group made some sense, as the other great fiefs were disappearing. 
the confusion would not be definitively settled till the reign of Charles IV, who issued his famous Golden Bull in 1356. Wanting to prevent any squabbling over elections, whether as to the composition of the college, the need for unanimity, or the possibility of double elections, he decreed that there would be seven electors, four secular and three ecclesiastical, with a strict order of precedence. But, but each would have an equal number of votes and the same set of privileges by virtue of their office. The secular electorates in order of precedence were the Kingdom of Bohemia, the County Palatine on the Rhine, the Duchy of Saxe Wittenberg, and the Margraviate of Brandenburg. The spiritual electorates in order of precedence were the Archbishoprics of Mainz, Cologne, and Trier. A simple majority from then on, four out of seven, would always suffice to elect a King of the Romans, who would later become Emperor. Moreover, their odd number prevented double elections. Following the example of... Um, the pre a previous king of the Romans, Rudolf I von Habsburg, who had associated each electorate with one of the empire's arch offices, though he was not the first, Bohemia, for example, had been arch cupbearer for at least as long as it had been a kingdom, each was assigned a hereditary arch office, mostly ceremonial, but still highly important. Mainz, Cologne, and Trier were the arch chancellors of Germany, Italy, and Burgundy, respectively, and in descending order of pr prestige. Bohemia, the Palatinate, Saxony, and Brandenburg were Arch Cupbearer, Arch Steward, Arch Marshal, and Arch Chamberlain, respectively. These offices and electorates were irrevocably tied together. Moreover, each electorate was declared indivisible and received the right of primogeniture. So one could no longer divide an electorate between one's sons, and the votes attached to them were uh, not divisible either. In addition to these offices, each electorate gained numerous privileges, as stated before. Every privilege which had been accorded to Bohemia uh, by c custom and by law, which had long been a special and largely autonomous portion of the empire, was accorded to the electorates. These included privileges like that of non-appeal. For example, uh, if an elector rendered a verdict in one of his courts, uh, this decision could not be appealed. Uh, nor could their citizens be called to the courts of other states of the empire. Another was a monopoly on gold, silver, and salt mining in their lands. Yet another was the right to mint their own currency. What's more, they could also enter into international relations and assemble freely. Notably, all these privileges abrogated those held that might be, he that might be in conflict with local previously granted privileges within their jurisdictions. Other privileges included the form of address Durchschlaucht, which means Serene Highness. It should be noted that, especially with the course of time, however, uh, all these privileges were not exclusive, and other princes might hold some or all of them. However, uh, these privileges were held purely by virtue of their electoral office in the case of the electors. So why these particular electorates? As stated earlier, these fiefs had been uh, represented among the electors from time immemorial, being descended from some of the very oldest and largest fiefs of the realm. The Kingdom of Bohemia was by far the largest and most powerful, as well as uh, Charles' own, and it was the only kingdom held by um, a prince within the empire rather than by the emperor as his, in his capacity as emperor. Uh, the Duchy of Saxony, though it was much smaller by this point, was the remnant of the once great stem duchy of Saxony, and thus held a lot of prestige. Uh, though it was very small, the Palatinate was more than just its territories. It possessed many of the emperor's old feudal prerogatives throughout Franconia and Lorraine and along the Rhine, and it was quite densely populated. Lastly, Brandenburg was a large and important fief, and it was directly descended from the old Nordmark uh, in the northeast. As said before, uh, Mainz, Cologne, and Trier presided over Germany's largest, oldest, and most prestigious seas, and they had combined to exclude Salzburg and Magdeburg, which were um, somewhat less prestigious and powerful. The choices of the Golden Bull, however, were not entirely without controversy. Bavaria's definitive exclusion was naturally contested by Bavaria. It had often participated in previous elections, and it had even come to an agreement with uh, the Wittelsbachs, who ruled the Palatinate, that they would alternate uh, from election to election. 
um, both of these fiefs had been ruled by, uh, uh, were ruled by Vittelsbox. However, uh, they were definitively excluded by the Golden Bull for the next 300 years. One of the justifications for this was that a Bavarian Vittelsbach um, held Brandenburg at the time, although this would soon be purchased by Charles IV. And another justification was that Bavaria had been the seat of Emperor Louis IV, who had been deposed by uh, Charles IV. Um, he had also been excommunicated. In fact, he was the last emperor to appoint an anti-pope. So another thing is the Habsburgs naturally felt excluded. They ruled Austria, Styria, and Carinthia by this point, as well as various territories in southern Swabia, and they were quite powerful, certainly more powerful than the Duke of Saxe-Wittenberg. However, they were excluded, and so this led them to forge something called the Privilegium Maius, or the Great Privilege, which uh, supposedly conferred archducal status upon them, the right of primogeniture, and all the other uh, privileges accorded to electors. But this was ignored by Charles IV. All, all, all other privileges saved the vote, that is. And it didn't become ratified until the Habsburg Frederick III was elected King of the Romans in 1438. However, these tensions were diffused by a pact signed between Charles IV and the Habsburgs in 1364, which declared that the Habsburgs would succeed his family should his dynasty go extinct in the male line. So the Golden Bull would clearly demarcate the electors as a special college which is sent with a sense of collegiality and a sense of shared responsibility for the empire. They possessed the right to be consulted on major decisions by the emperor, and the Duke of Saxony and Counts Palatine would serve as imperial vicars, that is to say, um, regents for northern and southern Germany during interregnums. With the formalization of the Reichstag and with, and the, with the imperial reforms of the late 15th and 16th century, they also possessed a very large share of the votes within the Reichstag, as well as the most exalted place uh, within it. The composition of the college would remain unchanged until 1623. During the Thirty Years' War, the imperial ban was pa uh, placed on the elector palatine Frederick V, and he was stripped of his vote and his lands, which were transferred to his distant relation, the Catholic Maximilian Duke of Bavaria, who also gained his office of Archsteward. While he was readmitted to the college with the Peace of Westphalia, he only gained the western portion of his lands back, and he was given the, the lesser honorary title of arch treasurer. In 1692, for the tremendous help rendered by Brunswick during the war, the Dukes of Brunswick Kallenberg were raised to the status of Elector of Hanover by Emperor Leopold I, and they were given the office of arch banner bearer. This, however, was pretty controversial, as there were many other fiefs that were of similar prestige and provenance, and they started to think to themselves, well, Where's my electorate? And so they protested. Uh, examples of the people who were kind of mad about this would be Baden, hesse Cassel, and Württemberg. Now, later, in 1777, the Palatine Wittelsbachs inherited Bavaria because the Bavarian Wittelsbachs uh, died out. And the electorate of the Palatinate was uh, basically abolished and and or absorbed into the Bavarian electorate. Now, with the French Revolution, uh, the French Revolutionary Armies, eventually under the leadership of Napoleon, uh, invaded the Holy Roman Empire. And with the Treaty of Lunaville in 1803, the left bank of the Rhine was entirely ceded over to France, which essentially destroyed the uh, three Rhenish um, spiritual electorates of Ma uh, Mainz, Cologne, and Trier, um, although Mainz was replaced by a uh, new uh, spiritual electorate of Regensburg. And with that, many new electorates were created. Uh, the electorate of Hessen, the electorate of Baden, the electorate of Württemberg, and the uh, newly secularized electorate of Salzburg. However, this new electoral college would never be able to exercise the vote as it's coming to the pressure of 
of Napoleon and his newly acquired vassals, Franz II in 1806 would um, dissolve the Holy Roman Empire. So that's it with my second video. I really hope you enjoyed it. Uh, I really hope to make more videos in the future, and what I'd really like to do is perhaps zero in on one of these electorates and make a video about them, or maybe make a video about another institution of the Holy Roman Empire. Um, I apologize for any mistakes. Uh, Mary